vous, vous vous retrouvez impuissant, que vous vous retrouvez stupide, que vous vous retrouvez humilié, que vous vous retrouvez démuni, comment faire Jokainen lääkäri varmaan pelkää komplikaatiota tai jotakin, että mitään niin ei niin kuin, ei hiffaa jotain juttua, mitä, mitä olisi pitänyt hiffata, joskin siinäkin auttaa se, että arvoin tekee yksin, yksin koko päivä töitä. Nämä, nyt, nämä tuli nyt äkkiseltä mulle mieleen. And what scares me is that making those decisions and making those wrong decisions and the realization that that decision Uh, of that decision in th three, four weeks time, where you end up having a patient who, in effect, can be crippled by life-sustaining therapy, um, which may not have been in their best interests or the family's best interests. And that still scares me. And I think it scares a lot of colleagues, but um, intensive care is much more multidisciplinary now. And I think that has helped our decision-making um, and has reduced that um, fear factor. Honesty and Humility go a long way, and most patients and relatives understand that we're also human, and mistakes can happen, uh, and should be openly discussed. Οι ασθενεί όμω έρχονται σε επαφή με εμά, ιδιαίτερα αυτοί που βγαίνουν από το νοσοκομείο, πηγαίνουν σε κέντρα αποκατάσταση και ύστερα από πάρα πολύ καιρό έρχονται να μα συναντήσουν, γιατί ξέρουν τα πρόσωπά, τα πρόσωπά μα, τι φωνέ μα, τον αγώνα που δίνουμε μέσα στον χώρο για να καταφέρουμε να του σώσουμε, να επιβιώσουν και έρχονται να μα δουν, να μα γνωρίσουν από κοντά, να του δούμε κι εμεί. In particular, the nursing colleagues, we arranged a wedding for a patient who was at the end of his life and had decided to marry his long-term partner before he later died. And it was very moving to be part of this very special event in the intensive care unit. It's a real privilege to be able to support a patient and their family through that um, what I hope is the worst thing that ever happens to them in their lives, to, to be able to support them through that, hopefully to recovery, or to support them um, through uh, managing a dignified death. Il faut, il faut, faut ramener la vie. Pourquoi est-ce que tout est si blanc et voire gris? Pourquoi est-ce que ce lino couine autant sous les crocs des médecins? C'est insoutenable. Pourquoi est-ce que, pourquoi est-ce que tout est autant aseptisé? C'est pas trois photos qui vont empêcher les gens de travailler. Moi, je pense que c'est important de ramener. Euh de ramener de la vie à cet endroit où, euh, où on se trouve euh, à la frontière d'eux, au bord d'eux, on se trouve euh, dans une espèce de no man's land où on euh, ne sait pas sur quoi ça va déboucher. Quoi. L'opinione della vita intensiva è fantastica perché mi hanno salvato la vita e dopo tre anni sono qui. Anche a un altro ospedale che mi hanno dato per morto, per fortuna sono arrivato in questa terapia intensiva e mi hanno salvato veramente la vita. Solo belle cose possono uscire dalla mia bocca ovviamente, perché senza di loro non sarei, non sarei qui, ripeto, non sarei qui oggi. Intensive care medicine allows me to learn something new every day. So every day I meet colleagues and I hear of their new technologies, new advances and progress in their particular specialty. But most importantly, every day is a different day with new challenges and I enjoy the interaction with my colleagues and most importantly with patients and their relatives. So it is a, provides a great variety, it's different every day and it's a specialty where 
progress is made on a, on a regular basis. Grazie perché mi hanno ricordato anche come si lavora. Cioè, io faccio questo mestiere, lo faccio da tanti anni, ci sono dei momenti in cui sei stanco, in cui hai, hai, hai le tue cose, nel senso che hai la tua vita, hai delle preoccupazioni, però io ero serena quando andavo via, non perché sapevo che non sarebbe morto, poteva morire, poteva star male, ma era nelle mani migliori, sapevo che era nelle, nelle migliori mani e, e questo mi dava, mi dava quel minimo di tranquillità che potevo cercare. È giusto che uh, i bambini che mi vengono affidati e i genitori quando vanno a casa possano pensare la stessa cosa. Siamo nelle migliori mani, quindi dobbiamo sempre fare il meglio. Grazie a loro per esserlo il meglio. I'm a critical care nurse. I'm proud to work together with other professions as a multidisciplinary team to fight COVID-19. Together, we are intensive care. I am an anesthesiologist and I'm proud to be an intensivist. Together, we are fighting COVID-19. Together, we are intensive care medicine. I am a critical care nurse and perfusionist. I am proud to work in the intensive care unit. We are working together to fight COVID-19 and together, we are intensive care medicine. I am an internist and I am proud to be an intensivist. We intensivists are working together to fight COVID-19. Together we are intensive care medicine. Good afternoon, everybody. We are um, delighted to host you today in this webinar that, uh, that will discuss the specific role of non-invasive ventilation with focus on high-flow nasal cannula. We have a, uh, a, a group of uh, fantastic speakers today. And uh, with no further ado, let me uh, ask my co-host, uh, Dr. Fratt, if you can first uh, introduce the speaker. Thank you very much, Sharon. Um, it's my pleasure to, to present Baron Rosberg, working in Hamilton, Canada, Department of Medicine and Critical, Clinical Epidemiology and Biostatistic at McMaster University. And uh, he is an expert on meta-analysis. He published many meta-analysis and also many guidelines on the use of NIV and recently on the use of high flow nasal oxygen therapy. Thank you, Bram, to start uh, this session and you have uh, 50 minutes. Thank you, JP and Sharon, for the kind introduction. And it's absolutely my pleasure to be presenting today on high flow nasal cannula and acute respiratory failure, specifically discussing what the guidelines say. In terms of declarations, I should mention I treat patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. I am an adult intensivist. I do work as a methodologist for a number of national and international organizations and was the methodologist for the European Society High Flow Guideline, which we'll talk more about. No other academic or financial conflicts of interest to report. <laughs> 
This is the guideline that came out uh, just in the last few months. We addressed four PICO questions as part of this, four clinical questions. Are the use of high flow in the setting of hypoxemia, post-extubation, peri-intubation, and in the post-operative setting. And it is for these four indications that we'll discuss some of the evidence and recommendations a little bit more. We were fortunate enough to actually publish each of these meta-analysis as standalone publications in ICM, CCM, or CHEST, which was an added benefit here, and provide more details around some of the evidence summaries. Before I get into some of the details, I thought just for a moment it might be interesting to discuss how the generation of guidelines and producing trustworthy guidelines has evolved over the last 10 or 15 years. And really with the publication of this guideline um, we can trust from the Institute of Medicine, a lot of these main tenets came to light. Conflict of interest management is crucial, both academic and financial, and this guideline was no different. We had very strict rules in terms of reporting and who could be involved in which questions. Having a representative panel, including multidisciplinary stakeholders, is crucial to make sure that all viewpoints are heard. Coming up with questions, prioritizing outcomes ahead of time, also crucial. As you've seen, each of the questions is addressed with a standalone systematic review meta-analysis. We rate the certainty of evidence for each of these outcomes and questions. <coughs> In addition to considering the evidence, we also consider the, the balance between benefits and harms, the quality of the evidence, individual patient values and preferences, costs, resources, these are all combined when and considered when coming up with the recommendations themselves, and they lead to clear, actionable guidance for clinicians. That's ultimately the most important, and to do this all using a very transparent process. We're left with either a strong or weak or conditional recommendation. Strong recommendations identify the fact that most well-informed patients would choose this course of action as opposed to conditional or weak, and those are synonymous, a conditional and weak recommendation are, are equivalent, and here recognizes that the majority of patients, well-informed patients, would choose the recommended course of action, but there might be a minority of, or at least a large minority of patients that would choose otherwise. And, and here it's where the benefit and harms more closely balance each other. All right, let's get into the meat of the recommendations. And let's start with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. This is the summarized evidence across all randomized controlled trials looking at the role of high flow in hypoxemic respiratory failure. And you can see, for example, for mortality, four randomized controlled trials, including 1,400 patients, addressed this outcome. And looking at the pooled risk ratio, 0.94, fairly difficult to make any uh, assessment in terms of conclusions for mortality with wide confidence intervals that go from 0.67 to 1.31. So a fairly uncertain effect on mortality, but our best guess is no real difference. However, when we look at intubation, you can see reported across seven RCTs, 1,600 patients, and a statistically significant reduction in intubation in those that used or were randomized to high flow as compared to standard of care. This based on low certainty evidence, you can see the upper end of the confidence interval approaches one or no effect, but certainly our best guess is that the use of high flow in patients with de novo hypoxemic respiratory failure reduces intubation. Certainly consistent with what I see at the bedside as well. I, I think with the increasing use in high flow in the last five or 10 years, it feels like we're probably intubating less. Patient reported dyspnea reported in five RCTs may be lower in those that are randomized to high flow, although you can see wide confidence intervals. And there's pathophysiologic rationale why patients with high flow might feel less short of breath, and in so much that we're able to more closely match their inspiratory demands, that you know when patients come in with dyspnea, they're sucking back and, and hoping for flows in the range of sometimes up to 80 to 100 liters per minute. And standard oxygen therapy often not able to match those inspiratory demands whereas high flow that can achieve flows in the range of 60 to 70 liters per minute, probably more able to match those inspiratory demands and therefore help alleviate that feeling of dyspnea. 
We looked at complications and they were very heterogeneously reported and difficult to, to summarize quantitatively, but no difference between groups. Some have suggested that there could be harm in using high flow, especially early on in these patients, in so much that we might be delaying intubation and those that inevitably end up still requiring intubation, and might this delay be associated with worse outcomes? And this group from uh, South Korea examined this exact question using a retrospective observational design, 175 patients, and they looked at patients that ultimately ended up failing high flow, requiring intubation, and compared those that failed early versus those that failed late, wondering if, if perhaps in this subset that are destined to fail high flow could the delay enacted with high flow lead to harm. And they did see an increase in ICU mortality and a decrease in ventilator-free days in those in the delayed arm, suggesting that there could be some harm, especially in those that inevitably end up requiring invasive mechanical ventilation uh, in delaying things. However, obviously given the design, there's confounding at play here, and this requires further evaluation and larger prospective studies. Despite this, the guideline panel, when weighing those benefits, a de decrease in intubation, compared to the harms, felt like the benefits far outweighed uh, any potential harms and made a strong recommendation for using high-flow nasal cannula in patients with hypoxemic respiratory failure. It was felt that high flow is relatively safe. The largest complication described is usually nosebleeds from uh, interruption of the nasal mucosa with the high flows but this is often compensated by using a humidified circuit. We did find one cost effectiveness study that suggested actually cost savings with high flow despite the resource costs with purchasing the units. This decrease in intubation and decrease with days requiring ventilatory support and ICU support translated into net savings. A lot has been made of the role of high flow in patients with COVID, and I think you're going to hear about this more soon in one of the subsequent lectures. There's concerns about risk of aerosolization. However, I was involved with this review published in the Canadian Journal of Anesthesia, found seven eligible studies looking at healthy adults, simulators, and those with gram-negative pneumonia, and at least from this review found no increased risk of aerosolization or risk to healthcare workers when using high flow in patients with COVID. Moving on from hypoxemic respiratory failure, what about using high flow in the post-operative setting? We found six or seven randomized control trials that specifically looked at this. All studies used high flow in the setting of prophylaxis for post-operative respiratory failure rather than treatment. And all studies specifically looked at high-risk surgeries, surgeries like cardiac or thoracic surgeries, and they dichotomized patients into those that were high risk, those that were obese, had a high ERISCAT score, or had underlying lung disease, as opposed to patients that were at average risk. And this is the need, this forest plot summarizes the need for reintubation postoperatively. And you can see that there appears to be benefit in those that were high risk, which is not seen in average risk patients. I do want to alert you to the fact that the numbers uh, in terms of reintubation are rare. So although it seems like there's benefit, the number of events are quite small. And weighing these pros and cons, the guideline panel ultimately decided to make a conditional or weak recommendation for using high flow nasal cannula post-op cardiac thoracic surgery, specifically in patients that were high risk or obese for a lot of the reasons that I've already mentioned. One of the other benefits of using high flow in this population for prophylaxis as opposed to non-invasive positive pressure ventilation is that it doesn't necessarily always mandate a post-op ICU admission. And some of these patients may be able to be managed on a step-down floor or on the ward, thereby preserving resources as well. The third question looked at the role of high flow in the peri-intubation timing specifically looking at uh, high flow for pre-oxygenation before intubation, but also the benefits of high flow is that they can stay on even during intubation itself, often not getting in the way of direct or video laryngoscopy. We found 10 RCTs that looked at high flow specifically in the setting, 2,200 patients. Five of these RCTs were in perioperative patients undergoing intubation, all high-risk surgical settings, 
And five of these RCTs were in critically ill hypoxemic patients looking at the peri-intubation timing. <clears throat> All of the interventions amongst these studies looked at, as I said, high flow both for pre-oxygenation, three to seven minutes prior to intubation, and also left on during intubation. In terms of comparison, seven of the randomized control trials compared high flow to face mask or bag mask, whereas three of the RCTs compared high flow to non-invasive ventilation. And when we look at the incidence of peri-intubation hypoxia, which is highlighted in this forest plot, no matter whether we look at ICU patients or perioperative patients, it does not seem like the use of high flow here decreases the risk for peri-intubation hypoxia. And therefore, the guideline panel actually made no recommendation for the setting of using high flow peri-intubation. Some in the panel felt like we should still make a conditional recommendation for using, and the panel was relatively split. But ultimately, with no evidence of benefit, we ended with uh, no recommendation, i.e. allowing clinicians to work as, as they want to. Although we did recognize that perhaps for those that are already on high flow, which we've already committed the resources and the costs, it certainly would be reasonable to leave the high flow on their face uh, during the time of intubation. We'll move on to the last question that was addressed by this guideline, the role of high flow in the post-extubation setting. We found eight randomized control trials summarizing 1,600 patients that looked at high flow post-extubation. I should mention that all of these looked at a high flow for prophylaxis for post-extubation respiratory failure, similar to the post-operative setting, and none of them looked at the treatment of established post-extubation respiratory failure. And amongst these eight RCTs, they were relatively dichotomized. Three of them looked at high-risk patients, in which had one of these features that are listed, and all three of these high-risk studies compared versus NIV. There were also five RCTs that looked at low or unspecified risk patients in the post-extubation uh, timing, and these five RCTs in low-risk patients compared high flow to conventional oxygen therapy. And dichotomizing these results based on those that were compared to standard O2 and low risk, as opposed to those that were high risk and compared to NIV, you can see benefit in high flow compared to standard oxygen therapy across the low risk population, and no difference between high flow and NIV in the post extubation period in those that were high risk. There were no differences in the other outcomes for either the high risk or the low risk population. However, probably not surprised to hear that high flow is generally better tolerated and more comfortable than non-invasive ventilation uh, based on uh, moderate certainty. And so uh, the guideline panel in looking at this data suggested using high flow compared to standard oxygen therapy following extubation for patients who are intubated more than 24 hours and have any single high risk feature. At the same time, they said for patients who clinicians would normally extubate to non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, we suggested continuing non-invasive positive pressure ventilation as opposed to high flow. And these were both conditional recommendations. Why did we say only those intubated more than 24 hours or with any single high risk feature if the benefit was seen in all low risk patients? Well, it comes down to the absolute risk and the costs and resources that are, are included. For patients that are only very briefly intubated, less than 24 hours and without any high-risk features, even a relative reduction in reintubation of 0.46 translates to a very small absolute reduction in reintubation with high flow. And when you're talking about such a low absolute reduction, it makes you wonder whether the costs and resources associated with this are worthwhile. However, when you start looking at patients that were intubated longer than 24 hours and the risk of reintubation starts to increase, especially with risk features, that same relative reduction in reintubation with high flow translates into a larger absolute reduction. And therefore, probably more justifiable to entail the resources and costs associated with using high flow in this setting. There's likely no doubt that there, there is a role for high flow and, and probably underused in this setting around uh, extubation. I appreciate your time and attention, uh, and I will step away, I think, for the next speaker now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bram, for this uh, great presentation. I think we will have, uh, there is a question, but we will uh, ask you the, this question at the end of the session.
So now, Sarah. So I will continue with the uh, introduction of the second speaker. Uh, we are honored uh, to have here uh, Professor Sheila Miatra. Professor Miatra is a professor of intensive care at the Tata Memorial Hospital in Mumbai, in India. She's president of the AIDAA, which is the All India Difficult Airway Association. She chairs the intensive care committee of the WFSA, and she recently led a global Delphi on the management of COVID-19 related um, acute respiratory failure in critical care, which was published, sorry, in critical care. Uh, we're delighted to have you here, Sheila, and the stage is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Sharon, for that kind uh, invitation. Uh, greetings from India. At the outset, I'd like to thank the European Society of Intensive Care uh, Medicine for uh, having me here. And uh, I will be speaking about uh, high flow nasal cannula oxygen strategies for use in patients. And I will restrict my presentation to severe COVID-19 uh, patients. And uh, Professor Rochberg has already set the stage by talking about the perioperative uh, indications of using high flow nasal cannula oxygen. I'd like to declare uh, that I have no uh, conflict of interest, academic or financial, related to this presentation. Now, when we have patients who come to the intensive care unit with acute hypoxic respiratory failure, we either give them oxygen, conventional oxygen therapy, or we use non-invasive ventilation or high flow nasal cannula oxygen, or sometimes even a helmet, depending upon uh, the availability. So recently uh, in the intensive care unit, along with uh, intensive care medicine, along with Audrey De Jong and Jonathan Casey, uh, we wrote this article on focus on non-invasive respiratory support before and after mechanical ventilation. And Professor Rochberg has very beautifully uh, given you all the evidence for the perioperative use. And uh, this is summarized very nicely in this uh, cartoon, uh, the indications for initial oxygen strategies during tracheal intubation and after extubation. As he's already uh, outlined, uh, high flow nasal cannula oxygen is superior to conventional oxygen therapy in patients with acute hypoxic respiratory failure. Uh, well, between NIV and HFNO, uh, there is, um, you know, the trial from uh, Professor Fratt uh, has shown no difference. However, in the subgroup of patients uh, using high flow nasal cannula oxygen, there were uh, increased 90-day um, uh, benefit in 90-day mortality. So that's why we are uh, considering high flow nasal cannula oxygen more and more. Uh, in these patients who present with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. As far as during tracheal intubation, uh, in patients with moderate to severe hypoxemia, especially in patients with P2F ratio less than 200, there is a benefit of using non-invasive ventilation. And uh, Professor Rashwag has already talked about the benefits of apneic oxygenation that you can achieve using high flow nasal cannula oxygen, because you can not only use it for pre-oxygenation during tracheal intubation, but also con continue it during attempts at intubation. And we've already got the study in NEGM from uh, Casey, uh, Jonathan Casey showing the benefits of gentle mask ventilation during this procedure. Uh, coming to after extubation, there is a role, as uh, Professor Rashwag has already mentioned, for high flow nasal cannula oxygen and NIV, but only in high risk patients. So we already know about uh, the benefits of high flow nasal uh, can, uh, cannula oxygen in patients who present with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure in, uh, in the ICU. And we're using a lot routinely to prevent, uh, you know, intubations, prevent patients going on mechanical ventilation. So what is different in uh, COVID-19 patients? They present to ICU with acute hypoxic respiratory failure, and they will need intubation. So high flow can actually prevent uh, many of these patients from getting uh, intubated and should be extensively used. So why do we have these reservations? So if you look at high flow nasal cannula oxygen in COVID patients, when you, you start this therapy of HFNO, you're usually looking at patient benefit. But in, with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, we're also concerned about risk of infection to the healthcare provider. So this has really have concerns not only about the patient benefit, but we're also trying to uh, balance this against the healthcare worker safety. 
So this has led to concerns because high flow nasal cannula oxygen, this high flow heated humidified oxygen that's going to the patient is considered as an aerosol generating procedure. So are we exposing our healthcare workers uh, to get infected uh, with SARS-CoV-2 while using this therapy? Should we be using this therapy at all? Was really the question in the beginning of the pandemic. So this is uh, a study that was published in the European Journal of uh, uh, Respiratory uh, Care a Journal in 2019, and they did a very elegant study. And this was, of course, not in COVID patients. It's a simulation-based study, and they used smoke. And they looked at exhaled air dispersion during high flow nasal cannula therapy, and they compared this with uh, CPAP using different different types of uh, you know nasal uh, prongs, and they looked at uh, different types, simulated different types of lung injury, both normal lungs, mild, and a different severity, and they use high flow at different flows. Uh, so HFNO at 10 liters, at 30 liters, and 60 liters. Very interesting study, uh, stimul simulated study. And what did they find? They found that when you use uh, high flow at rates um, like uh, 60 flow rate, both in normal and mild disease, compared to at, at flows of 30 and 10, there was a significantly higher exhaled dispersion distance. In And this was a distance, median distance in min, uh, millimeters. So this led to concerns that probably, even if we use high flow nasal cannula oxygen, we should probably limit uh, the flow that we're using. So early in the pandemic, due to the hypothetic risk of transmission to healthcare workers at the beginning, uh, experts recommended uh, either restricting the use of high flow nasal cannula oxygen or if at all it was used, limiting the flow rate to less than 13 critically ill patients. Now, this recommendation uh, led to intensivists uh, either not using it or adopting an early intubation strategy because they were limited by the flow. And uh, into early intubation was also a practice for other concerns related to the pathology of the disease. So the risk of bioaerosol dispersion associated with high flow nasal cannula oxygen has since then been uh, questioned. And this is uh, another very elegant study that compares high flow nasal cannula oxygen with uh, oxygen mask and looks at environmental bacterial contam contamination. Now, this was not done in uh, COVID-19 patients, but this was done in patients with bacterial pneumonias. And this was a randomized uh, crossover trial. It was a non-inferiority trial done in a small number of patients. And they looked at the environmental contamination using bacterial tray, uh, plates and also air sampling and very interesting findings. Um, so they looked at the gram negative bacteria and the total bacteria count at day one, day two and day five. Uh, and if you notice that there was no difference when uh, high flow nasal cannula was used uh, compared to um, conventional oxygen therapy in terms of the contamination with the gram negative bacteria at uh, various decisions or even the uh, air pollution. So uh, high flow nasal cannula and Dr. Uh, Roshwag has already alluded to this and this was a systematic review that was done uh, for the WHO and uh, uh, Professor Roshwag was a part of this systematic review where they looked at the effectiveness of the aerosolization, the dispersion and the infection transmission. And this was a um, small number of studies, only seven studies, three were in mannequins, three were done in uh, uh, COVID patients, and one was this study in bacterial pneumonia. And what they found was uh, definitely there was a benefit with use of high nasal cannula oxygen to reduce the uh, need for invasive mechanical ventilation in these patients. But there was very low certainty, uh, you know, the uncertain findings with regard to droplet dispersion and aerosol generation. So nothing to recommend that there would be these concerns if you used, uh, uh, you know, different flows and whether we should or should not be using it. So no real concerns shown. Of course, these were small uh, studies, mannequin studies, but this meta-analysis did not show any difference. Now, uh, there's uncertainty about whether this is an aerosol generating, uh, um, you know, whether it generates aerosol and at what distance and how, but we do wear our personal protective equipment. And over time, we've begun to realize that perhaps if there is a benefit to patients with uh, COVID-19 and we could avoid intubations, the known benefits in non-COVID patients, uh, why don't we use it? And we know that appropriate PV should protect us. So more and more confidence has come in using these non-invasive uh, therapies that were presumed to be uh, aerosol uh, generating. Now, um, other uh, this is a very interesting study that I found in the Annals of Intensive Care. And uh, this is from a group of uh, French intensivists. And what they did is they put surgical mask on top of the high flow nasal cannula oxygen. 
and uh, they showed that it could improve the oxygenation in critically ill patients and these patients who present with hypoxemic respiratory uh, failure. So very interesting uh, study. They looked at just using high flow nasal cannula oxygen and using HFNO with a surgical mask, and they compared different aspects, the PaO2, the SaO2, SpO2, the P2F ratio, and they also looked at the uh, partial pressure of carbon dioxide because they would be concerned that there would be an increase uh, in these levels. And very interesting, whatever concerns were expressed were not really realized. And their study shows that a surgical mask, when it's placed over the patient's face, was already treated with a high flow nasal cannula device would actually avoid, offer an advantage in terms of oxygenation in COVID patients. And this oxygenation improvement is also associated neither with a clinically significant change in uh, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, and nor were there any uh, sort of uh, subjective patient uh, complaints. And uh, this was a review that was published in uh, Critical Care very recently, and they have looked at practical strategies to reduce the nosocomial transmission to healthcare professionals uh, providing respiratory care with COVID-19. And they've looked at the various uh, strategies which uh, put the healthcare worker at risk. And if you look at high flow nasal cannula oxygen, they've said the recommendation they've made is that you should have a proper fitting nasal cannula, and you should and you should try to place a surgical or a procedure mask over the high flow nasal cannula uh, to prevent further transmission or risk to the healthcare workers. Now, what evidence do we have for the use of high flow nasal cannula in COVID-19 patients uh, in the intensive care unit? Now, this is a very elegant study uh, using high flow nasal therapy to avoid invasive mechanical ventilation, and this was done in COVID uh, uh, pneumonia. Uh, this was a study, it was a retrospective study done quite early in the pandemic, published in Allens of Intensive Care, and done by a French group. And here they compared standard oxygen therapy versus uh, high flow nasal uh, cannula uh, therapy. And this was a, a retrospective study and their primary endpoint was to look at invasive mechanical ventilation. And as you can see, there was a, a difference uh, in the uh, primary outcome between the use of high flow nasal cannula oxygen and standard oxygen therapy uh, when uh, looking at invasive mechanical ventilation. But this was a small study and a retrospective study. And and it showed that high flow nasal cannula oxygen in COVID-19 patients with acute respiratory failure was associated with a lower risk for invasive mechanical ventilation. Another uh, uh, study that was performed uh, by um, Alexandra Demul et al. And this was published as a letter in the uh, Blue Journal, high flow nasal cannula oxygen in critically ill patients. And here, this was again a retrospective study, and they looked at 379 patients in the intensive care unit, and they compared those who uh, received high flow nasal cannula versus those who did not receive high flow nasal cannula. And this study, it was a propensity score matched analysis were done, and they this on the x-axis, as you can see, these were the days since ICU admission, and this was the proportion of uh, the events uh, leading to invasive mechanical ventilation, which, as you can see, were much higher in the patient in which high flow nasal cannula oxygen was not used. Now, this was another study from uh, Professor Artiga and using high flow nasal cannula in patients with COVID-19. And uh, this was a prospectively done study and uh, they looked at high flow nasal cannula and early intubation and compared uh, these two. And these were patients who presented to the intensive care unit who were on, uh, on oxygen therapy, not uh, ventilated, and they looked at intubation within the first 24 hours. This again was a propensity math study. And finally, they were able to get a matching in 61 patients in both the arms. And uh, the primary outcome was ventilator-free days and the length of ICU uh, stay. And there was a significantly uh, lesser, uh, um, uh, more number of ventilator-free days and lesser stay in ICU in the patients who were in the high flow nasal cannula uh, oxygen group. So they concluded that the use of high flow nasal cannula upon ICU admission in adult patients with COVID-19 uh, may lead to an increase in ventilator-free days and a reduction in ICU length of stay when compared to early initiation of mechanical ventilation. Now, these were small studies, retrospective studies, one prospective study. Now, do we have any data on what are the predictors of failure when you use high flow nasal cannula oxygen therapy with uh, acute respiratory failure? Because this is very important uh, information. And this was, again, an observational study, but a multicentric study done in Spanish, uh, 36 Spanish and Andorran uh, intensive care units. And uh, they screened um, over 1,000 patients, 259 patients were uh, finally included. 
and 140 of them were not included and 119 patients were intubated. And these were patients who received high flow nasal cannula uh, oxygen. And when they did a, a regression analysis to look at what were the predictors of failure in these patients who received uh, high flow nasal cannula oxygen, uh, it was the non-respiratory SOFA score and also the ROX index, which is the uh, ratio of the P2F ratio divided by the respiratory rate, and they had a cutoff value of 3.5. So these seem to be the predictors of failure when high flow nasal cannula oxygen was used in COVID-19 patients. So small studies, retrospective studies, prospective studies with propensity matching done, but no uh, prospective randomized control trials. And uh, this kind of limited data leaves us, uh, you know, really asking as to uh, what is the role of high flow nasal cannula oxygen. And very recently, I'm, all, I'm sure you've all seen this paper that's published in JAMA, and this is from uh, Professor Antonelli and his group. And this has compared uh, the effect of helmet non-invasive ventilation with high flow nasal cannula oxygen and looked at the respiratory free uh, day support in the intensive care unit. And this was in uh, moderate to severe hypoxemic respiratory failure. And their primary outcome was days free of respiratory support and a uh, very nice elaborate protocol that they used. And when they looked, compared high flow nasal cannula oxygen with um, non helmet non-invasive ventilation. And uh, when you look at the primary endpoint, respiratory support free days, uh, there was really no uh, difference between the uh, two interventions. And the authors concluded that in critically ill patients with moderate to severe hypoxemic respiratory failure due to COVID-19, the helmet non-invasive uh, ventilation compared to uh, high flow nasal cannula oxygen resulted in no significant difference in the number of days of respiratory uh, support within uh, 28 uh, days for these patients. Of course, um, the helmet uh, uh, may not be available uh, across the globe, and that gives you some confidence that there is a good role for using high flow nasal cannula oxygen uh, in these patients with uh, COVID-19. So looking at the kind of studies that are available, very small studies, no uh, randomized controlled trials, small studies, retrospective, prospective studies, but with propensity matching, uh, we thought, why don't we do a Delphi on the uh, use of high flow nasal cannula oxygen uh, and, um, you know, try to establish what the exact role of high flow nasal cannula oxygen should be in patients with uh, COVID-19. Uh, and we did this expert consensus statement using this Delphi process and Professor Inav and Professor Jaber are part of this Delphi process. So I was very, uh, I'm very proud to have led this expert consensus statement, uh, this Delphi process that was published uh, in critical care in March, uh, along with Dr. Prashant Nasa and a team, a steering committee, and 39 international experts, and a very good geographical distribution of these experts, uh, 20 countries, six continents. Uh, just in brief, we did had multiple choice questions, Likert scale questions, and we used Likert statements. More than 70% was considered as consensus, and for multiple choice questions, more than 80%. And we also assessed stability between the last two rounds. And uh, based on this, we were able to achieve over 73% consensus in the management of acute respiratory failure. And based on our statements, we were able to produce 20 clinical practice uh, statements. And I'll just talk about the uh, statements on high flow nasal cannula th therapy. What was the consensus among the experts? And they accepted that high flow nasal therapy should be considered as an alternative strategy for oxygen support. And in brackets is the percentage of consensus. High flow nasal cannula uh, therapy should be used in patients who are unable to maintain saturation more than 90 using oxygen delivery through a venturi mask and also may be used in patients with increasing oxygen requirements. And uh, you may need to, uh, this therapy may uh, avoid the need for trachea intubation in uh, an invasive mechanical ventilation. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that high flow nasal therapy should be considered as an alternate strategy for oxygen support in COVID-19 patients. And these concerns about transmission of infection uh, uh, has not really been established, and this should not limit the use nor the flow, uh, the flow that you're using for high flow nasal cannula oxygen. And we have preliminary data that shows that high flow nasal cannula oxygen in these patients reduces the need for invasive mechanical ventilation, can lead to increase in ventilator free days and a reduction in the ICU length of stay with no if, uh, apparent effect on mortality. Of course, we need future studies to confirm these findings because the data is very limited. Uh, strategies to reduce the infection for the healthcare workers, 
should include the appropriate use of personal protective equipment, a properly fitted nasal cannula, and also wearing a surgical mask over the nasal cannula. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Miatra, for a fascinating talk, a very important one at this time. We are particularly grateful for your uh, having found the time to do this talk, given the difficult uh, circumstances in your country. It's very much appreciated. And uh, we will have questions for you at the end, so please wait. Um, and uh, Jean-Pierre, would you like to continue with introducing the next speaker? Yeah, thank you, Sharon. So now I'm uh, very pleased to introduce uh, Samir Jaber, a French guy working at Montpellier in south of France, a very nice place. He's working in the Department of uh, Anesthesiology and uh, Intensive Care, and he has a, a lot of publication on ventilation about uh, airway management and also uh, non-invasive support. Thank you, Samir. You have 15 minutes. Et très heureux de te voir. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. Thank you, Sharon. I'm very happy to be with you. First of all, I want to thank uh, Sheila, as said by Sharon, in this uh, very difficult situation in India of all what happened. And I want uh, to say to her, uh, we are all with uh, all the people in India in this uh, very bad situation. Uh, I will try to focus mainly my uh, talk on the uh, perioperative and postoperative. My conflict interest, I'm a consultant with Honorarium with uh, Faisal Pekel company, and uh, I have no difficulty to say what I want to say with Faisal Pekel because they never uh, influence my uh, different uh, talk uh, since more than 10 years. This is my objective during the next 15 minutes. The question is which ventilatory support could be used after surgery? Now, actually, we have uh, the possibility to use, uh, as said previously, non-invasive ventilation using uh, ICU or home or uh, dedicated NIV ventilator. You can use the uh, NIV or CPAP home ventilator. And now, more recently, as presented first by uh, Bram in the first uh, talk, we can use high-flow oxygen uh, therapy. Sorry, because during my talk, sometimes you will see some uh, slides with high flow oxygen therapy and other with uh, Hopti flow, which is the code name of uh, Fasha Pekel, but is uh, exactly the same for discussion. Just five minutes to recall some physiological point of view for the more young uh, people. That's what are, what are the main ventilatory support, especially after surgery or after extubation to prevent uh, re-intubation or to treat. First of all, this is the airway pressure in yellow. You have in white the flow. This is actually your on my spontaneous breathing ventilation. This is my breathing pattern. As you know, you are a sinusoidal flow with uh, zero centimeter plus minus one uh, centimeter of water in uh, the mouth. So when you use, uh, you apply a positive and expiratory pressure, as you see, for example, eight centimeter of water, which called continuous positive air pressure when it used alone, called CPAP, and it called PEEP when it used with another positive mode, you have also a sinusoidal flow, and you just have the difference that you not reach zero, but you stay at eight centimeter of water at end of expiratory pressure. So what is non-invasive classically ventilation is when you applied another positive pressure with a dynamic one, which is called almost often driving positive pressure. You know, here we insufflated seven centimeters of uh, water, often called pressure support ventilation. Then you have seven plus eight, it's uh, 15 centimeters of water, positive and expiratory pressure in all in the alveoli at the end of inspiration. So it's often called non-invasive ventilation, by PAP or PSB, plus PIP, and the difference is it's, that it's active, non-passive like CPAP, because you need to deliver a pressure. This is deliver a decelerating flow because it's more physiological. And as you know, at the start of inspiratory, if you have the maximum of flow that what we use this mode in an IV. This and where we can place high flow. This is my 
personal point of view, and high flow is between standard oxygen and CPAP. Not exactly a CPAP or PEEP1, because in reality you uh, stand out at zero at end, but uh, expiration, but it's like a CPAP, a light CPAP, uh, because you can uh, deliver two to four centimeters of water at end expiration uh, in uh, the majority of the case, but not more. So what can imagine the approach? As said by Bram first uh, talk, you have a curative one and the prophylactic or preventive one. Curative application of ventilator support is when acute respiratory failure is present. And the objective is in this situation to avoid intubation. In contrary to prophylactic or preventive is to try to avoid the occurrence of acute respiratory failure in patients without acute respiratory failure. Many in present at high risk. That's why when you look uh, the different, um, for example, meta-analysis, you will see that we classified the, the patient at high risk or low to moderate risk. Obviously, you have a gray zone because it's not very strict. And for each situation, each uh, indication you have, you can use a low pressure, which is uh, OptiFlow, because you have very low uh, positive and expiratory pressure. You can use a real CPAP, which can reach more than 10 or 50 centimeters of water. And you can use a non-invasive ventilation, mainly when you have a uh, hypercapnia associated to hypoxemia. Just a small publicity for uh, the journal is uh, you can um, read uh, the last uh, number of uh, intensive care medicine journal in December when you have all what every physician should know on acute respiratory failure on mechanical ventilation, and you have several paper on uh, high flow, especially as you see it by Bram Rochwell, who manages this uh, very nice uh, uh, clinical practice guidelines and other by Jean Damien Ricard on the, all the specialists, uh, the experts in the world participated to this. You have, I, you have to read this nice uh, guideline produced by uh, the uh, um, European Society of uh, Intensive Care and Anesthesia. Uh, leading by, my, by Mark Leon and Sharon, as you see, and you can find some recommendation uh, according the evidence. As you see, you have low quality evidence to suggest the use of H, uh, high flow oxygen for hypoxemic after cardiac surgery, but you have, um, you see here, the recommendation also are weak for other situations, but we will discuss this situation. This is uh, the same slide showing first by uh, uh, Bram in the first talk, that you can have uh, three figures in the original paper. You will see that in high-risk uh, population, you don't have uh, less escalation of respiratory support. However, in the average risk population, you have some uh, benefit in favor of high-flow oxygen therapy. So just the prerequisite to use uh, high-flow, you can, uh, for me, it's more easy to uh, to always separate the free function of the ventilation system, that the airway system, the gas action, that is uh, the lung function, gas exchange, and the muscle pump, that is mainly the muscles, the diaphragm. So, where are the action of uh, the high flow oxygen? Mainly in uh, using high FiO2 in gas exchange. You have the effect of the CPAP peep like. Um, even it's a very low, less than five centimeters between two to four, but it's sometimes efficient. And this could be also affect the diaphragm mobility. And in my point of view also, you have an effect, uh, never reported, but now we are going in Montpellier study to evaluate the effect of upper airway because we observe it in our practice, many after surgery, in obese or in patient in post anesthesia care, like that like CPAP, in especially in patient with, uh, in obese patient with obstructive sleep apnea, you can have the same uh, effect that um, the CPAP and maybe you can limit it, the, the decrease of the upper airway diameter in this situation, maybe it also participated to the effect that you observe. Obviously, you have, for me, it's the main uh, action, is the, the conditioning of the gas, mainly the humidification and the heat, uh, 
which uh, allows better uh, mucociliary clearance. And in my point of view, this is probably the main action that we observe, we observe the positive effect in this situation. This is my personal point of view. Obviously, we can discuss this one. The second objective one is the date spate washout, which could be very beneficial in some patients, especially in some hypercapnic patients or obstructive patients. Then you have the addition of all of this uh, physiological effect. You could improve uh, the comfort of the patient, and the results are the decrease of inspiratory effort, mainly by decreasing the work of breathing. This was clearly and nicely reported in this uh, paper that presented forth, uh, leading by Jean Damien and uh, Gonzalo Hernandez, which explained the different mechanisms that I presented to you uh, in this uh, slide. This is the same one. You can see you have probably five uh, major effects, uh, which could explain, but probably the humidification could explain why in high flow oxygen, very high, uh, you have the positive uh, effect. This is to understand why we could use this in um, the post-operative period. This slide summarizes uh, the um, main modification of respiratory function, as you see, which leading a restrictive syndrome, all the association of this, and a diaphragm dysfunction with atheoptasis. This is a vicious circle, as you see, which leading to hypoxia with respiratory failure and pneumonia which could worsen by the fluid overload during surgery and during the anesthesia management. The consequences of a postoperative pulmonary complication, as you see, you have an increase of mortality. Patient with acute respiratory failure after surgery reported here, 60% of mortality in comparison to 0.3% uh, with patient, in patient without an acute respiratory failure. That our challenge is to avoid the, the, uh, this complication after surgery. This is a slide to summarize the different strategy. From the left to the right, you have standard oxygenation. You see here very low oxygen therapy, the high mass concentration, the high flow oxygen, and the different strategy of high flow, CPAP, BiPAP, and IV. And um, at the end, unfortunately, intubation for invasive ventilation. So the paper, this uh, by leading by Bram, as you can see, uh, Bram presented us the five uh, and the four main uh, recommendation, and we'll focus on this uh, surgery part, and mainly you see the abdominal, cardiac, and thoracic. This is uh, my, uh, with my friend uh, Emmanuel Futé. We published recently the pump ventilation. It's uh, the approach that we should avoid the complication after surgery by using positive pressure from the beginning, the preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative, and we reported the effect of non-invasive ventilation by the NIVA study. Um, we showed that the NIV could decrease the rate of reintubation in patients who developed acute respiratory failure after abdominal surgery. You can see here we decreased by 30% uh, the rate of reintubation. So what about uh, the prevention of uh, hypoxemia uh, after surgery? We performed uh, with uh, our group the OPERA study, OPERA study leading by uh, Emmanuel Futi and uh, our colleagues, is to evaluate uh, high flow oxygen to prevent hypoxemia in abdominal surgery. You see here um, the inclusion criteria. We anticipate duration of surgery at least two hours or more. We not included uh, the obese patient and the emergency surgery in this situation. And the primary outcome was the hypoxemia one hour after extubation and at the end of allocated treatment. The secondary outcomes are the classical ones. However, so sorry, the results are totally non-significant between the two groups, that means between high flow oxygen therapy and standard oxygen therapy in terms of occurrence of postoperative hypoxemia. And the same is true for the postoperative complication. So it's really we were disappointed. And the same is true, as you see, for all the different secondary outcomes. So it was a negative study. Why it not works? One hypothesis is that the patient who uh, have not received the um, 
uh, no positive pressure during surgery cannot be uh, treated by high flow oxygen because to avoid or to reopen um, atelectasis, we need high pressure, more than five to six centimeters. That means that's why we use non-invasive ventilation to uh, open the alveoli. However, for those who received the, the standard uh, positive pressure during uh, surgery, uh, that's called the improved strategy, have a better uh, outcome. So what about thoracic surgery? We have this nice study from uh, our friend uh, Francois Stéphan in, uh, from in Paris, who performed the high flow oxygen therapy versus non-invasive after cardiothoracic surgery. And this study was a positive one because it's a non inferiority study, because you see this kaplan echo is absolutely similar with similar reintubation rates using uh, either non-invasive ventilation or high flow oxygen therapy. And uh, in the group of obese patients, the same is true in this uh, strategy. So my, uh, this is my last, uh, before last uh, slide, my take home message is always front of post-operative acute respiratory failure, please eliminate before everything a surgical complication. And if you have a clinical, ga clinical and gas exchange improvement, you can continue to apply the high flow oxygen therapy. However, if you have no clinical and gas exchange improvement, please stop and probably intubate the patient or use another strategy such non-invasive ventilation. Finally, my take home message are the following three points. As I said, post-operative acute respiratory failure, the main message please always eliminate the surgical complication. That means you need to have um, a CT scan to eliminate a complication and to uh, consider reoperation. The second high flow in selected post-operative patient could be proposed. We have uh, today strong evidence of safety, then I have at first line therapy to prevent or to treat hypoxemia, or as an alternative to CPAP or BiPAP as reported in uh, cardiothoracic uh, surgery, mainly uh, by the study of uh, Francois Stéphan. Finally, please, like uh, other strategy of non-invasive ventilation, high flow should not delay the time of reintubation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Samir, for this very amazing uh, presentation with so much uh, figures. So uh, perhaps, Sharon, you can start with the first uh, question. Uh, yes, so uh, we've been receiving questions from the audience, and we too have questions. It depends on the amount of time that we will have. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Miatra. Um, we received the same question twice from two different people uh, regarding uh, the effect of face mask, uh, surgical mask on top of the high flow nasal cannula. Do you have any uh, thoughts on uh, why it increases uh, FiO2 or uh, why it increases uh, perhaps PO2? and um, any infectious issues? Right, actually, um, that was a very, I found that very interesting because I thought the idea of putting a mask over uh, the hypronasal cannula was basically what uh, to, you know, avoid transmission or whatever aerosol was generated to the staff. But uh, an interesting finding, or maybe it was just an association, was there's also increase in the um, saturation and uh, also no increase, uh, significant increase in the uh, PaCO2. So, I, I mean, the authors also haven't given a definitive explanation for this. But uh, definitely from an infection standpoint, I would say that um, we cannot swear and say that there is no aerosol generation. Of course, we have our PPE as a frontline, I mean, final kind of thing to protect us. Nevertheless, if some putting a mask over the hypronasal cannula oxygen doesn't produce uh, any adverse events, why not do that if there's an additional protection against uh, aerosol generation? Thank you. Um... Uh, unless, uh, Jean-Pierre, you want to ask something, I also have a question uh, to Bram about peri-intubation. Um, yes, uh, then I will ask a question to Samir about uh, this Please study. do, please, please okay. do. Uh, uh, first, Samir, as you, as you, for, for conclusion, you said that you can use a high flow as an alternative to uh, 
to, to NIV. Does that mean that your first treatment will be NIV for this patient? And how long you, you, you use uh, this oxygen support in, in your patient or through your, your study you, you report it? Thank you, Jean-Pierre, for this question. In our practice, we use both. That means you use mainly after abdominal surgery in intensive care or in post anesthesia care, uh, non-invasive ventilation to prevent atelectasis or to treat because non-invasive ventilation deliver high airway pressure. You know, that means you use at least five to six centimeter of PEEP and we use at least four to six centimeter of pressure support ventilation. This is absolutely necessary to reopen the the uh, the lung in some case of uh, atelectasis because we reported that uh, high flow oxygen could not reopen the alveoli because to reopen closed alveoli we need more than two or three centimeters for uh, the whole lung. The, but we use high flow oxygen therapy for all the patient between the non-invasive trial. We use preventive non-invasive trial in all our abdominal surgery because in ICU we receive the high risk abdominal surgery. The other goes to uh, not in, uh, in ICU, in, they go to the wards. So we, our approach is to probably use both, not contradictory. I think there are not, we should not consider competition between non-invasive and high flow. It's absolutely uh, synergic. We use in our practice preventive NIV trial at five to six hours per day by um, trials of 30 minutes, like in uh, physiotherapy. And uh, when the patient tolerated, because sometimes the patient is not in uh, uh, acute respiratory failure or don't have dyspnea, we try to explain to the patient that it's like physiotherapy, kinesiotherapy, but it's uh, better accepted. You applied a short session many yes, times it, a day. Yes, it's it's better accepted than long session. We, in fact, in our practice, is around twenty five minutes. Started from ten minutes to one hour, depending the tolerance of the patient and the severity. That's why I said we can always say preventive, curative, but in the real life, it's sometimes gray zone. We have a, a lot of liver transplantation patient. We can start with them. It's very uh, apneic patient, no problem. And uh, at, at the start of the on call now, for example, at, at the end of the night, you have a patient with respiratory distress. Then the same patient could be prophylactic, gray zone, and uh, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> curative situation. Okay, thank you, Samir. Sharon? Um, yes, we have a couple of uh, very interesting practical questions from the audience, so we'll skip mine and we'll go to the audience's uh, practical questions. Uh, one that I found particularly interesting is uh, how you handle gas swallowing and stomach uh, dilation. Or is there any level or a specific level of PEEP or pressure that you would uh, put an NG tube in? And the second one, and if you could answer both, this is to all the speakers, um, how, do the, how do I know whether to increase the FiO2 or the, um, or the flow, particularly in COVID-19 patients? If anybody has any idea how to respond to these, it would be great. So let's start with uh, Samir. Do you want to perhaps uh, respond to the NG uh, I, I question? Want be, I want to be... Uh some courtesy for Sheila. I prefer Sheila start for uh, the last question about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so ladies first. Okay, so I will address ladies the first. second question. <laughs> I will address the second question, uh, if I may. So uh, regarding, um, you know, titrating the flow and uh, FI, I mean the FiO2, uh, a lot of times people think this moves in parallel, but actually you have to set them independently. So I would set the FiO2 based on my target saturation that I want to achieve. 
And of course, I'm not aiming for 100% saturation. I'm okay if they are setting above 90. So I would titrate uh, the FIO2 to, these le to the level of saturation that I aim to achieve. And uh, regarding the flow, I would look at the patient's work of breathing, the respiratory distress. So initially, of course, you have to start with a much, uh, you know, you start with a high FIO2 and you come down to your targets, you know, uh, come down with the FIO2. Regarding the flow, you have to start with a lower flow because this is not well uh, tolerated. Though you're giving heated humidified oxygen, it's not well tolerated uh, by the patient. And then you gradually increase uh, the patient, the flow to match uh, you know, the patient's comfort level. So I look at how, uh, you know, what is the desperate distress, what is the work of breathing, and I tight, increase the flow uh, just enough to make the patient uh, comfortable. Now, in the COVID uh, era, you know, we are concerned about giving high flows, of course. So you don't have to keep everyone at 60 flows. I come down on the flow. If I see the patient is comfortable at 40 and 30, I come down to lower flows. Uh, and also, uh, presently in India, we're facing a shortage of oxygen. So we're trying to come down on the flows as far as possible. But of course, giving the patient uh, what, the, what he needs. So oxygen conservation is not a, very, a strength of the high flow nasal cannula. No. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, I, I can uh, report our practice and my personal recommendation today. We initially start by uh, the application of um, the Florali protocol. That is absolutely the recommendation uh, initially, the recommendation protocol um, made by uh, Jean-Pierre in the first uh, uh, landmark study. But now, and uh, as said by uh, Sheila, the tolerance is very poor in postoperative patients. So my position is uh, now to always put the FIO2 setting to one, to 100%, this is our practice, and to always just uh, decrease the flow. Because the flow, sometimes more than uh, 13 or 14 in our patient, is not well tolerated. So, and moreover, I don't believe personally about the CPAP effect. I don't believe it. I, I believe that it's very small positive pressure. We performed several studies and we showed, we, we showed that the mouth open, you never, you never have more than two or maximum three centimeters of water in all the situation. So in my point of view, the effect of PIP is very, very low. In my point of view, I, this is uh, some data showed, and that's why we, I, we prefer to use high FIO2 and to benefit of the humidification and heat uh, oxygen therapy, and we decrease more and more, and it's better psychologically for the nurse and the doctor to have a lower uh, flow uh, with FIO2. This is our position. Maybe it's totally open. I know that, Ram, you have another position, but it's very interesting that they think to discuss uh, this point of between pragmatic bedside uh, practice and some uh, literature point of view. I think it, it does depend. It is great perspective, and, and I certainly agree. And I think that there is a little bit of difference between patient populations as well. You know, perhaps in the post-operative setting, they don't tolerate the high flows as well. But my experience sometimes in those that come in quite hypoxic and, and um, uh, air hungry is that being able to titrate up those flows is what actually helps address dyspnea and, and better matching those uh, inspiratory demands, especially in patients that are so uh, dyspneic and breathing in a rate in the 40s or 50s. Uh, I get more, sometimes I put it on just for flow. They might not be uh, actually hypoxic or that high degree of hypoxia, but by titrating up the flows, I'm able to deal with the dyspnea and buy me some time to evaluate to see whether they would need to proceed to intubation or not. So I do think that there's a little bit of some type of patients and titratability. Yes, but we are, we are probably both. You have the FIO2 effect, and that more you increase the FIO2, more you increase the real oxygen delivery in the trachea, as you know, because in the very acute severe patient with a high oxygen demand, with uh, uh, having the high demand, you have you need to have a high inspiratory flow, and then you never reach uh, more than 80% in the real life of uh, FIO2 in the alveoli. That's probably why in this very sick patient, as you, uh, the very sick hypoxemic patient, it's better tolerated high flow than the other one. You're right about the selection of the population.
Yes. It's Thank true. you. Um, I don't know if we have enough time for more questions or. I can ask a question for Sheila. Sheila, what yes. is the main practice now in India? Because we are very, it's it's hard for us to see what uh, we see the television every every night, every evening. We see what happened in India, and uh, we are very uh, sorry for what happened. And what is the main practice in uh, the ICU or in the personality care? What is the main uh, ventilatory support uh, today? So first, I just like to say, don't go by just what you see in the media. Things are pretty no. much under control now, but. Across the country, we've become very conscious about oxygen conservation, and we're not uh, we're, we're taking all kinds of measures to limit the use of uh, oxygen. So it's not that we're saying don't use hypernasal cannula oxygen, but we're trying to say, you know, use it if only if you absolutely need to use it, and if at all you can come down on the floors, come down on the floors at the earliest. You know, don't just keep everyone on 60 floor. If you can manage with 30 floor, 40 floor, uh, you know, we're checking for leaks. We're uh, not giving, trying to target 100 saturation. So various measures are being taken, uh, not only in areas where there's shortage, but even where there isn't shortage, acknowledging the fact that we have a huge number of patients who are coming into the ICU. It's almost like a tsunami, you know, large numbers. So we're very conscious about this and trying to limit the oxygen that we are using. Thank you. We so we perhaps a last question, uh, Sharon, if you agree, about um, sure. the use of high flow, a prolonged high flow therapy and uh, the, the problematic of oxygen toxicity. I think there is no data about that, but perhaps you can uh, answer to, to this uh, question high flow, high, prolonged high flow and oxygen toxicity. Bram, the, in meta-analysis and this, all the study you, you, you made, did you find something about that? Yeah, un, uh, unfortunately, uh, there, uh, at least in our reviews, no. Although, you know, we focused, especially for the guidelines, more on patient important outcomes. And we did look at mortality at 30 days for a lot of these interventions, especially in hypoxemic respiratory failure. We looked at ICU length of stay. We looked at duration of respiratory supports. And certainly if you expected uh, with prolonging uh, high FiO2 therapies with high flow and oxygen toxicity, increased free radical production and, and harm via these pathways, you might expect impact on some of these, these patient important outcomes like mortality at 30 days, hospital mortality, duration of ICU, and we did not see any harm uh, in terms of looking at these. So not to say that uh, it's not a risk. Uh, I certainly worry with uh, setting such high FiO2s over a prolonged period of time, but it doesn't, at least from a meta-analysis and uh, evidence summary perspective, translate into those patient important outcomes, at least based on the data we have. Thank you. I don't know if my colleagues Great. want to add anything else. Jean-Pierre, maybe we will uh, have more data in the next two years by the Megarox study. The Megarox study is a study uh, leading by uh, the ANZIC group, uh, which will include uh, 40,000 40, patients with liberal versus restrictive oxygen, but included all patients, that means acute respiratory failure and patient without, and we will see prolonged effect of this. This is crazy study. We have to see the results about this. Yeah, yeah, and yes, in the but, inter interim uh, uh, next month, I, uh, you should all expect to, to see the results of the PRISM trial, which is coming out. Uh, 4,000 patients uh, randomized to CPAP. Very interesting results. Um, we should all look forward to that. What are the results? Uh, <laughs> can't tell you. <laughs> you can't. Read, read the discussion. <laughs> So, so um, thanks, uh, uh, yeah, Jean-Pierre, could you perhaps uh, uh, say thanks on our behalf to everybody? Uh, for me, it was a great pleasure to be with you guys here and uh, with the great audience, and uh, please. Thank you, everybody, for this, uh, all your presentation, and I hope that uh, that will help uh, everybody to, to use iFlow or other oxygen support. And thank you. Uh, yeah. So thank, thank you for being with us this afternoon. afternoon. Great talks, everybody, and great audience. Thank you. Thank you.
Goodbye. Bye-bye.